Okay, this is sort of a Friday Reads because this is actually what I've been doing and reading, but it's unlike a Friday Reads because we're not going to talk about what I'm going to read next. Today we are just discussing me attempting to read the Nebula shortlist, what I thought. The winners, the losers, the DNFs, all of that. I have a reaction video to the shortlist where I basically go, I, I don't know how I feel. <laughs> like, that sort of thing. Um, it didn't seem like potentially the Writers Guild was really going to align with my taste this year. But I still wanted to try because there were enough books on this list where I was like, well, maybe because I was so ambivalent to 2023 releases, there's something I missed and I need to pick them up. And on one hand, there was a book that I read and I was like, oh my gosh, I really loved that, that I would have never picked up if not for this project. But equally, there were some confirmations of like, yeah, I just, I was right to skip that. It really wasn't like, for me, not because it was bad, but because I was ambivalent. I just didn't really care. And growth, I actually DNF'd things. So we're going to discuss it in order, I think, from DNF and then least favorite to favorite sort of thing. Um, if you want more in-depth thoughts, I did do a full vlog experience for my patrons. There's Donna in there and stuff like that. And I actually, at the beginning of that video, try and rank what I think my ranking would be. And then, you know, see, see what happens by the end of the video, which just really proves that I have no sense of when I will love something or not love something. So starting with the DNFs, I would show you the books, but they are all library copies. And those are not all the DNFs. The DNFs are alas, these three, but I'm just going to show pictures as we go because these are so shiny, so shiny. So the first two DNFs we'll talk about are the ones that I'm for sure DNFing. I'm not picking them up again. They're not bad. I DNF them because they would have just been three stars. And I didn't want that. I just was like, I don't want to be reading a three star book right now. And three stars aren't bad. It's a well-crafted story with a good use of characters and world building and thematic stuff. But it's like, I don't have a connection to it or an attachment. Um, so the first one I DNF for this project was the Terraformers, which I was pretty sure I might not love that much. Uh, the Terraformers, it's um, a generational science fiction story. I read the first half of it. Um, so 150, 200 pages of it. I don't know. I was doing some yard work while listening to it. And like each part is like a different group of people or generation, not like super far spanning um, on this planet that is being terraformed by a corporation. And it's basically as far as I got into it, we are looking at how in each generation society evolves, rights are obtained, how they kind of push against what the corporation wants because unbeknownst to the corporation, there are some people who were there early on in the terraforming process that didn't die off, that didn't leave, and there are repercussions for that. Um, also a lot of conversation about what it means to be alive and human and sentient that is brought into it because it's not just humans. And also, you don't really have a human type person. People are not born the same way. This is very far future science fiction. Um, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's definitely, you know, covering the ground it wants to cover. I've just read versions of this type of science fiction, like with this narrative framework, with this type of how do we relate to the land and exist with it? How does our definition of sentience evolve? Like all of those scientific ideas. I've just read in ways that I remember being more engaged with in things like, for example, semiosis. Semiosis, I really adored. And although it's not identical to this, it had elements that made it more engaging to me. It had more thriller, unsettling vibes. It had a relationship with the plant life that I thought was really fascinating. And it's generational jumps. It just worked for me. It worked better for me. I could see this working better for other people. It is slightly more character driven. But I think why I had to DNF it is even though I could see objectively, this is focusing on characters, their relationships, their focuses, wants, hopes, dreams, issues. I, I couldn't care about any of them. There were moments in the first part that I was supposed to have emotions. I could tell I'm supposed to be emotional. And I wasn't, I just didn't care. And so that's why I put it down. It's because I didn't care. And it's not necessarily because the book did something wrong, but at some point you gotta cut your losses and just move on. Um, similarly, I read the Water Outlaws. I read like first 150, 175 pages of it. Um, and this one, again, it's a very good version of what it is. Uh, we have a character who is just trying to get by in society. It's really hard to get up in the ranks as a woman, especially I think she's a woman in the military and she is well respected, well regarded. She keeps her head down. And then one day she's put into a situation. There was nothing she could do, but she was put in a situation and then she's exiled. And it's following her exile, meeting a new group of people who are kind of bandits, revolutionaries. It's a very, um, the patriarchy is bad. Um, this empire is corrupt. There's also this nefarious thing in the North. 
it's always something in the north um and weapons that are being put together because there are some fantasy elements but there's like a science fantasy part point to it because you can science the magic and so we had like when i was reading it like three to four point of views and they were interesting enough point of views but i again was having an issue caring about any of them um and again like i am a hard sell ironically on this type of resistance rebellion um, narrative framework, not because it's bad. I mean, it's done a lot in science fiction and fantasy. It's probably one of the most used like motivations for characters to do a thing in a fantasy and science fiction book. But that also means that for me to care, it has to do it in a way that engages me. And this one was just very similar to other things I've read before, but did it better for me. So my closest comp was like the Jasmine Throne, um, which I love. or. I mean, The Unbroken is not really about the patriarchy. So the Jasmine Throne is truly like one of those, we have a very patriarchal empire and we are bucking against that. We have a reluctant protagonist hero character. Um, it's, it's, you know, we have a community of women and we have three point of views that are approaching the problem from different perspectives. We have a weaponization of magic. Like all of that was in that book, but I adored the Jasmine Throne and connected to it so strongly. And here I was lacking that connection, even though from a craft perspective, nothing was done wrong. It just, I, again, I, it's a 500 page book. And at some point I was just like, I don't care. And one of the characters, she was just like so gullible and it was gonna like, and then, so, and it's very realistic that this would happen. I'm not even saying it's a bad decision, but I was just very much like, oh, I don't want to deal with this. In the bandit camp, there was already being set up like conflict within them when we already are going to have conflict with like the empire. And I'm just like, I can't, I can't. I just don't want to. So yeah, I was just fairly ambivalent. At first I felt very cozy because it's a very comfortable story, like in terms of like, yeah, I've seen these, these tropes before. The writing style is really easy. There's nothing difficult there. Um, I just, like I said, kind of bounced off of it. Uh, the one that I honestly don't even have enough thoughts to give you about because it's a pause for now because like my brain was truly like, ooh, I think I might like this, but like, ooh, cannot. My brain's like, can't do it. That's the Saint of Bright Doors. And I might come back to this later because it's also on the Hugo list. This is just like very intentional word placement. <laughs> type book. Um, I hesitate to call it flowery or literary or anything like that, but I could just tell that the formation of the sentences was important and my brain was just like struggling to have to be that focused. Um, and I really do want to try it later. I think another potential issue with it, and again, I've only read three chapters, which is like nothing in this book, um, is initially you are at a distance. And when I read the flap of this book, it's about a character who had a traumatic upbringing of, in their childhood and they're dealing with that in therapy. And then there's also this kind of supernatural stuff around him, his upbringing, the world he lives in. Um, I was really interested in unpacking that trauma and the minutia of his day-to-day -day life, but I wanted to be closer to the character. And I think we might be getting closer to the character now that we are in adulthood. But again, I never really got down to just like having the brain power to keep going. Because the first couple chapters are just like childhood and quick blink of adolescence. And then it's adulthood in this weird, like dreamlike ethereal setting. And that was another thing. It's like, I just couldn't get grounded fast enough with my current headspace. So I want to give it a shot again in the future. But for right now, it's a pause. So like, I don't have strong opinions about it one way or the other. I can see why it's been nominated by authors. Honestly, actually very happy slash shocked that so many people who nominate for the Hugos actually read it and nominated it. Um, cause I just didn't, I didn't even know it was published last year. And like, I don't think I'm under a rock when it comes to publishing, but apparently for this book I was, cause a lot of people read it and liked it. Like, it's interesting because it's what I wanted to happen for the spear cuts through water last year, but, but I digress. All right. So now <laughs> onto the three books that were on this list that I have read. Um, one I read a while ago and I've talked about it a lot. It's my one star maybe two stars. I don't know. It's I really don't like it. Witch King by Martha Wells. <laughs> I really don't like this book. Um, what can I say about this book that I haven't already said many, many times? Um, this is a book I should have DNF'd, but I didn't because I was being a completionist for another project. So that's on me. The book probably would have been DNF'd just like Water Outlaws and the Terraformers. So it should be in that grouping because I knew within 50 to 100 pages of that book that I did not care and I didn't think I was ever going to care. Um, it's just a little weird, but it's not weird in a way that I found engaging. And I could not relate to the characters' motivations, their wants, their desires. It's another sort of like 
the current government's bad, but maybe this other government's bad. And I say government, but I'm just talking about like power structure. So maybe we need to insert this other thing. I, I was so just like confused, not because I couldn't keep up, but because I just didn't know. I didn't have buy-in. I was never given a chance as a reader to have buy-in. So I didn't like it. I'm like, I wasn't surprised it was on the Goodreads Choice Awards because Martha Wells is very, very popular. Like Murderbot has done amazing things for her career and her success. So like, sure, even though maybe not many people have read it, people added it to their want to read shelf because it's a new Martha Wells, of course. Nebula, I guess makes sense because a bunch of people in the author space, I think really like Martha Wells as a person and probably actually really like what she does with her craft. It's just not for me. And like the Hugos is obviously Martha Wells is a Hugo darling, but it's just like, this is not a great book. <laughs> like I could see like it being really good for mega fans, but like the average person, like I feel like I'm an average sci-fi fantasy reader. It's just not very good in my opinion. And like, I don't say that very often, but I just don't like anything about its craft. So I don't know. Like, I don't know. I think the last time I felt like this, and it, I still liked the book even more, was Gideon the Ninth. And I really liked Gideon the Ninth comparatively to this. <laughs> and I was just as weirdly confused and ambivalent. So I don't know. Uh, the next one is like a solid book. Um, and this is uh, Shiggity. I just keep calling it Shiggity because I can't ever remember the rest of the name. Shiggity and the Brass Head of um, Ubalufan. Um, this one was fun. Uh, this one, <laughs> this one's interesting because I feel like it's called Shiggity, but it's actually equally about this other character. And I think her name is Noma. I think I'm just trying to find the spelling of it because I listened to this primarily on Audible. Yeah, Noma. Because I don't know why, but the, uh, not Audible, my library, but the audiobook does not line up with the phrasings in this book. So it's, I think the person who did the audiobook read like maybe the English publication. Because I guess if you don't know this, sometimes if a book is picked up, in the UK and the United States, they have different publishers, which means different editing teams, which means same meat and potatoes, but maybe slightly different phrasings. And obviously I have this version and it did not line up with the audiobook, but I really liked the audiobook, So I just listened to that, which means I don't know the spellings for most of these gods. <laughs> but we have Noma and Shiggity and they have this partnership. Um, they are free spirits, which is not normal. There's a very corporate capitalism adjacency to the spirit world. Um, especially as we keep going on in civilization and people pray less. Um, there's this whole organization made to make sure that the prayers are sort of divvied up, but it's also kind of corrupt. And Shiggity used to work for that and it was made free by Noma. And the, the storytelling of this, you start in Mediares at the end of the book, and then you kind of have different points of flashback for both Noma and Shiggity, and you get brought up to date. As we go, it has a heist story. They need to do this one more task to be truly free spirits. And that means that they can just get spiritual energy whenever they want. And they don't have to work through these institutions. And one of the driving forces of this story is Shiggity and Noma have this partnership, but it's also deeper than just a partnership, like just a work relationship. But there's obviously tension there because Shiggity is all in and Noma's not. And it's unclear why. And you learn more about that. And I just found it, uh, I found that part of it very engaging to me. Um, I will say Noma is like fallen angel succubus type energy. So that means there are a lot of lusty scenes. And I know that sometimes I think if it, especially if you're not prepared for like erotic moments, or you know, you want those in your romance books, you don't want those in your like literary fantasy sort of things. Just know, like, if you've read American Gods, there's stuff like that, like that with that lust goddess, it's definitely in this book. So I enjoyed Noma immensely. She's actually the main character to me. Uh, I really enjoyed learning about her, her relationship with her sister, why the way she is the way she is. I loved seeing her meet people throughout time and make deals with them and how she brings them back. Shiggity was a little more boring to me. Um, he wasn't a bad character. Um, and I feel like there was supposed to be some payoff at the end of the book that I was just like, I don't know if I really feel like this is the conclusion arc that I thought we could predict was coming. And then near the end of the book, it tries to bring in the whole politics of the spirit world in a way that I was just like, that's too big scope. I didn't want the big scope. I just want the little scope that we were with. Um, so I think it kind of lost me to the end and it got very action heavy. Like if you want God fight scenes, it happens. And I'm just like, whoa, what's happening? What's going on? Um, so yeah, it's a good book. Um, I think, like I said, it lost me a little near the end. It was definitely stronger for me at the beginning. But I'm glad I read it for this. Um, and I mean, I always like godlike things. I think another thing is since I've read this near 100,000 Kingdoms and Broken Kingdoms, when we got into the societal god space, 
it just wasn't as good for me as it was in that interpretation. And obviously these are all just interpretations. Um, but yeah, it was a good time. Now the, uh, <laughs> the shining star, the surprise, the, oh my gosh, I was not expecting this was translation state. This is my favorite by a long shot. And this isn't just like my favorite because like all of these are misses. Like this is like almost a five star read. <laughs> like I really liked this book. Now I don't like ancillary justice. I gave that three stars. Okay. okay. And three stars isn't, I don't like it, but that means it was work. A three star for me is this was too much work. I was not motivated to read it. I like to generally be motivated to read. That's why I read. I want to be motivated to pick up things. I was not motivated to read ancillary justice. I could not put translation state down <laughs> and it's not an like a action packed thing. It was just, I was really into the world building and how that was doled out. Um, I was very into the three characters we were following two more than the other, which is why it's maybe not completely a five because there's like one point of view that I didn't like love. I really liked the blending of the large scope to our tiny intimate problem. Cause it's a very intimate story in a very global situation with a treaty that needs to be passed. So I'm gonna answer one of the big questions. Do you need to read the ancillary justice trilogy to read this book. Um, truly, I do not know. I read the first book, so I kind of understood how gender works because that's one of the things about this empire is that different parts of it, gender is used differently. So if you're in the rock empire, everyone's a she, but we weren't there. We were in different parts. So there were different gender names and pronouns that are used. Um, there are also different species of things. So I was a little prepared with a scaffolding of how this world building could be, but honestly, I don't remember anything about the world building in Ancillary Justice. And all I remember is the main character and their motivation. That's all I remember. And I was easily into this world. Does it spoil something in Ancillary Justice? I don't, I like the Ancillary Justice trilogy. I don't know. Um, there is a character that is obviously probably connected to what was happening based off what I remember, but I didn't have any context for that character. I didn't know who they were and it didn't bother me. <laughs> I just learned about them in the moment in which I met them. Otherwise, our three main point of views are not in that trilogy. The part of the world we're in is not the Rock Empire. And like, yes, maybe we're taking place after the events of that trilogy. So maybe big global events could be spoiled. But for me, as someone who DNF'd that series and picked this up, I was 100% fine and had so much fun. <laughs> maybe because there was so much of the world to explore. We all know I love exploring a world and this was done in a way that I really enjoyed. But the characters, like we have, um, three characters from different walks of life. The first one you meet is like at a funeral um, for this person she took care of that she obviously had an ambivalent relationship with and the wet and the funeral goes completely no way that anyone expects. I love that as a premise. I love that in contemporary space. I love that in science fiction and fantasy. It was awesome. Um, and then she gets put on a task to solve a mystery and that's how she gets connected with the other characters. We have one who is obviously not human and you don't really know how, who or why. It's like the only first person point of view, I think chapters. And it's fascinating, like in terms of a species and learning about them and their roles. And then also it's just like even ignoring all the cool alienness of this character. It's just like a coming of age story. Like you just, this person does not want to fall into the roles that they've been told that they have to. And then how do they deal with that? I, that was beautiful. And then we have Reet, who's an adopted person who's never felt belonging and trying to find belonging. And you learn about his history and how it connects to the whole thing. And it, th these intimate stories of these people's problems and how they intersect combined with there's this treaty happening worked really well for me. I, I was very invested the entire time I was reading it. I was listening to the audio when I wasn't reading it. Like I rarely do reading and then audio and then reading to like make it so it consumes my whole day. I never read at work because I'm always busy preparing for my next class. But for this book, I was like, mm, you got 20 minutes. You could read another chapter. Like I was that invested. <laughs> so that's the winner. This, this whole project was worth it because I did miss out on translation state. It's, it's, it, I think it was very engaging for me, which is why I read, I like to be engaged. And I think it did a lot of thematic stuff and a lot of world building stuff that I want to see in an award-winning book. So I don't think it's gonna win. Maybe it will, I don't know, but it's my, it's my pick. Cause partially I wonder how many people are gonna read it because it's like, don't I have to read the three books and provenance before this? And I, I don't think you do, but I'm also not like a big stan. <laughs> of the whole empire. I just really like this, like one little book in this world. And I think part of it was the character stuff. Like I had minimal character connection in ancillary justice. Um, I had a lot of issues mainly because, and it was by design, the main character in ancillary justice is working on figuring out emotions. <laughs> so they were just pretty much a, you know, a wall. A lot of the times <laughs> there wasn't a lot of emotion there. 
Anyways, so that's this project. That's, that's how I felt about the ones that I've read, and that is why I DNF to the ones that I did DNF. And let me know your thoughts on any of these books down below. And if you want me to try and do this with the Hugo books or any other award lists, I'm for sure going to check out the Ursula K. Le Guin Award, of course, because like, that one's my favorite. If you haven't seen, I read all the books for that one last year, and it was a wild success for me. And I'm very excited about the judging panel this year. Oh, so pumped. Anyways, um, if you want to leave an emoji to let me know you're here, uh, leave a spaceship for a translation state. And also just because these are sci-fi books. How many of these are sci-fi books? I don't know. There's a whole blend. There's at least two sci-fi books. <laughs> and otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.